Well, once again, we greet you, brothers and sisters, friends, guests. <clears throat> We're so glad you're here on this resurrection morning. We can celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, together. Uh, we ask that if you're physically able, you please stand for our call to worship as we prepare to uh, open up our hearts and our minds and trust that God's Spirit is going to lead us in this time of worship. We begin our worship this morning with a phrase that Christians around the world have said on Easter. Read responsibly. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning and we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We are thankful that we can say he is alive and that because of his sacrifice for sin, we too might have hope of eternal life. Lord, as we come together this morning, we want to honor you and praise you. We want to glorify you in song, in prayer, in the preaching of the word, in our fellowship, and in all these things, Lord, we want to give you praise and we ask that you would move by your spirit in our hearts to cause us to rejoice in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And if there be any here today, Lord, that do not have that hope, may you open their hearts even this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ the Lord is risen today, Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Sing ye heaven and earth reply.
is our living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless praise? The God of ages stepped down from glory and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living conquering death, 
death has been defeated and the power of death has been crushed. Father, we, we hope and pray that all in this room here today know that hope. So I would ask if there be any in here today, oh God, that don't know that hope, would you work in their hearts the work of grace? For all of us here today, if you know this truth and you can confess it, if you want to lift your hands as we sing this chorus one more time, or just sing out with your voice. We want to sing these words together in such a way that just expresses the joy that we have. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. that we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you for singing. We're going to take a few moments and greet one another. Children are now dismissed to children's worship.
You didn't know we had dudes who could sing like that, did you? That was great. Well, I had my Easter greetings to you this morning. So glad to have you here. We have many guests in this service. We're glad to have you here. And uh, thank you for coming. Happy Easter to you all. Um, next weekend, our pastors, both here at South Campus and over at West, at Risen Hope, all of our pastors and their wives will be on retreat. We're going to the Holy City, uh, not Jerusalem, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, <laughs> where uh, I used to pastor and where my girls were all born, and uh, home of the Big Red. So we'll be at a retreat next weekend. Brother Jim Wold, who's in our service this morning of Desert Light Ministries, will bring the message from 1 Corinthians 16, and then during the middle hour, our friends Ted and Dawn Siemens, who are literally, I think, in the air, flying back here uh, from Cyprus, where they've been living, and uh, they're going to be sharing in the middle hour. So um, plan on next Sunday. It'll be an excellent Sunday, and pray for us as we retreat uh, 
I'm, I'm actually giving one of the messages, so I'm uh, trying to figure out what to say. I think, you know, something on hell or something, probably. No, I'm teasing. Jim is here, that's why I'm joking. This morning, we're, we're just celebrating that this is the first Sunday where our West Campus is formally and officially known as Risen Hope Baptist Church. And uh, it's a big marker in this five-year journey that we've been on uh, to, to start the West Campus, and now to uh, later this year, we'll be releasing it as its own church. That hasn't officially happened yet. We're still one church with two locations, but step-by-step, uh, step, moving toward their uh, being birthed out of us as their own church. And so I promised Pastor Jason and Pastor Jimmy that we would be praying for them this morning. Also, just in case you're not aware of this, we've been praying very diligently and fervently for Vivian Simmonsma. Yesterday afternoon, uh, she and her daddy were airlifted from Sioux Falls to Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh, Cincinnati uh, is evidently known as the foremost pediatric cancer uh, hospital in the country. There's a specialist there who has a unique treatment that they hope will be of help. Uh, they can also do uh, some relief to her heart that's related to the tumors in her. And so uh, literally now, this morning, well, about right this moment or so, um, Mama, Kayla, and uh, baby Calvin are landing in Cincinnati and uh, will be joining Andrew and Vivian. And so we want to pray for them especially as well this morning. And then the news came this morning during first service that uh, the sister-in-law of Larray Olson uh, passed away. Barb passed away just this morning. So what a, what a time to go to glory on Easter. So lots to pray about. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a good reminder that at the cross, Jesus paid it all. And what a great reminder Easter is, that Christ is risen from the dead. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And nothing is the same ever again, because Christ is alive. Lord, we thank you for the message of 1 Corinthians 15, this great resurrection chapter. And as we look into it this morning, God, we just are so thankful that we will be raised imperishable and that you have swallowed up death. That is the best news of all. Lord, we pray for our church family out west of town, uh, Risen Hope Baptist Church this morning. We pray for Pastor Jason and Pastor Jimmy and, and as they're probably right about now, uh, uh, finishing things up, Lord, we pray. We've had baptisms this morning as well as Easter message. We just thank you for their ministry and we ask your continued blessing. Ask for growth and ask for the powerful work of your Holy Spirit in their church life. Thank you for um, just every way that you have blessed this effort over the years. Lord, we're praying for the Simmonsmas today. We pray especially for Vivian, for your healing touch in her body. Lord, we pray for their recovery now in this uh, dramatic transition that they've made to Cincinnati. We pray, I'm sure they're exhausted. We pray for rest, and we pray for wisdom for those who will treat Vivian there. And Lord, we just thank you for the outpouring of prayer and love and support from our church and from hundreds of others. We just lift the Simmons Ma family to your throne of grace. And then we pray for Lorraine's family too, her brother especially, in the death of his wife this morning. Lord, we pray for uh, that as they remember Barb, that they would find special delight in the fact that she is absent from this earthly body, present with the Lord on this Easter day. And so we pray too for Lynette Vanderhoff and for Don, for their family as, as things are drawing near for them. And we pray, Lord, for Jereen as she's been uh, in special care as well at home. Lord, there's so many things. Probably everyone hearing my voice right now has some special concern, a burden, a need in their life. 
And we're so thankful that we can bring these things to your throne of grace. You hear and you are at work. And so we trust in you. Thank you, God, for the work of your Holy Spirit. And we rely on that work even now as we open the scriptures and see the message of Easter and take it to heart that you, O oh God, have swallowed up death forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and to this uh, conclusion of the 15th chapter. It's a three-week journey we've been on in this resurrection chapter. Much longer journey through the book of 1 Corinthians. We're getting closer to the end now. Saints together, the church for a lost city. And we want to uh, read this text and just keep in mind what we've seen before. You know, that Christ rose from the dead. He appeared to more than 500 witnesses. There were eyewitnesses who had seen Jesus alive, who had interacted with him, who had eaten meals with him, who had walked with him on the road to Emmaus. He was very much risen from the dead and alive. He conquered the tomb and came forth. And this great passage concludes with those stirring kind of poetic lines, death is swallowed up in victory, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? This is the hope of Easter. This is our promise from God for Easter. Yes, we celebrate it once a year in the spring, but much more than that, we celebrate it every day of the year. Because Christ is risen indeed, and so we will be raised, and we will reign with him. And so with that in mind, would you stand for the reading of 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 58. If you're physically able, stand with me. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of weed or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same. But there is one kind for human, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For stars, star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now, these references to the last Adam, to the man of heaven, this is Jesus being spoken of, right? Jesus. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, the man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so shall also we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, 
for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. O oh God, show us the way to a steadfast, immovable, abounding faith and life in Christ in these tumultuous days in which we live. Show us that, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Last week we saw that great prophecy in Isaiah 25, verse 8, where it says of God that he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Well, what we're reading about and what we're celebrating today on Easter is the fulfillment of that prophecy from Isaiah. It is the act of God's grace in which through the resurrection of his son Jesus Christ, he has swallowed up death. And death is a defeated foe. And Christ has won the victory. And he is the first fruits of many. Now we live in a tough day. Actually, to be honest with you, these last few weeks we've been feeling a great heaviness. And I said, not just referencing myself, but our staff and our elders, our church as we've been wrestling in prayer and crying out to God, so many things. In terms of our own church family, I mean, there have been um, agonizing things like Vivian with her cancer and the impact of her cancer on her heart. And, and just we've been crying out for the Simmons family. We've had three folks related to our church in hospice care. And, and, of course, there are many other kinds of distresses and difficulties and discouragements. Perhaps you've been feeling it, too. But we could go larger. We could go on the national scale, in which it seems like one after another, people have been uh, taking up guns and, and killing. Of course, James says in his letter that you don't get your way, so you kill. Well, that's the story of our time, isn't it? People who feel they have not gotten their way, and so they take up arms and they kill. They even kill children. It's an evidence of the moral decay of our nation. Everything is in turmoil, it feels like. Our government, our politics, confusion over sexuality and so forth. All of these things are the result of sin and defying God. And with those also natural disasters, tornadoes, and so forth. And we could go even larger to the global scale. There are ships playing war games in Taiwan. As Taiwan has become a political football, there are explosions in the Middle East, in Israel, and the surrounding countries as bombs are tossed back and forth. Civil wars in Africa terrorism of various kinds all around the world. It is not hard to be shaken to your very core in these days. 
We could be easily given to fear. We could easily be given to hopelessness or despair, and many are. So in the midst of all this, how do we find our equilibrium? Where does it come from? Where does hope spring from? How do we become as this text talks about at the end there in verse 58, how do we become steadfast and immovable? How do we abound in the work of the Lord? How do we know that our labors are not in vain, they're not worthless, they will produce fruit? How do we know? Well, that's the whole point of this passage. We find these things in the message of Easter. That is, the message of hope through the resurrection. That if Christ is raised, then too, those who are in Christ will be raised. If Christ is alive and reigning forever, and we will reign with him, then our hope and our confidence is not due to the circumstances, which no question are deeply troubling, But our hope and our confidence comes from the truth of Christ who died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin so that we can be set free and forgiven. Jesus Christ risen from the dead, conquering sin and death and Satan. Christ alive and ascended to the right hand of the Father where even now he intercedes for his people. Prepares a place for us. It's the Easter hope of the resurrection. Well, let's look at it in the text, shall we? The question is asked in verse 35, how how are the dead raised? It's a skeptic's question. I mean, it doesn't seem possible, does it? I mean, how could that possibly be? How could a dead person come up from the grave? And, And if they did, what kind of body do they become? And Paul answers that question by saying, you foolish person. I think what he's saying is, don't you understand the basic principle here? There's a basic principle that for the seed to spring forth with life, it first has to fall into the ground and die. This was the teaching of Jesus, now echoed by Paul. And he says, when that kernel... Uh, wheat or whatever grain falls into the ground and dies, then as it, as it decays, suddenly from it springs forth new life. He's, of course, drawing the parallel with the death of Christ and then Christ coming back from the dead, bursting forth from the tomb. And what he's saying is that God is going to give you a resurrection body. Now, it won't be like the other bodies, It'll be the body as he has chosen. And he goes into a kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it poetry, but sort of a prose, kind of a creative prose little section here. Verse 39, not all flesh is the same. There's this flesh for humans, and another for animals, and another for birds, and another for fish, and he's kind of, Just saying, think about what God has created. What the master designer in his creative design, I mean, if you love the animal world or you love the birds, you're the bird watcher or or you love to go out and wet a line and you see the wonder of these fish that come forth, maybe you like the pictures in the Natural Geographic and see the great infinite variety of what God has created And then from there he says, and there's, verse 40, heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. The glory of the heavenly is one kind, the glory of the earthly is another. And then he goes even back into this whole thing with creation. One glory of the sun, another of the moon, another of the stars. And for star, differs from star. And the word that's repeated, you see it there, again and again, 40 and 41, is glory, 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 glory. There's a great, magnificent glory in all these bodies that God has made, even the heavenly bodies. And these days, we have the Webb telescope, right? Even improving upon 
the Hubble telescope and showing these incredible images of the universe, of the billions of stars, of the galaxies. It's incredible. And what Paul is saying is, if God is able to create all of this, the infinite variety of all of this, the, the incredible beauty of all of this, verse 42, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. You think all of that's pretty amazing? All of that's pretty incredible? Well, it's going to be even more magnificent. You're going to have a resurrection body, he's saying. You're going to have a body like the Lord Jesus' body. So how are the dead raised? They're raised to a heavenly body. They're raised to truly something truly extraordinary. Something out of this world. Something amazing. Verse 42, it's imperishable. Verse 43, it's glorious. It's powerful. Verse 44, it's spiritual. Marshall Siegel, in an article kind of expanding on these, offers these three phrases, which I found so helpful. I want to share them with you. The perishable must put on the imperishable. He says, this is life without death. Our resurrection bodies will no longer Deal with death. Won't be part of it. The decay and the disease and the growing old and all the rest that we deal with here on earth, no. We won't deal with that anymore. It will be life without death. The glorious, rather than the dishonor, the dishonor of earthly bodies with sin and corruption, no. The resurrection body will be life without sin. No longer deal with that. Powerful, no longer weakness. Powerful, this will be life without weakness. No longer will we deal with weakness. No longer will we deal with failure, inability, disability, and so forth. No, it will be the power of God in us. And then finally, spiritual, which Siegel calls life without limits. No limits. Scholars are all quick to point out that by spiritual, he's not saying here sort of an ethereal ghost being floating in the air. That's not what he means. You're not going to come back in your resurrection body. You're not going to be Casper the friendly ghost. That's not what it's going to be. Why? Because... We know that Jesus in his resurrection body, he had a body, a, a real literal body. I mean, he, he cooked uh, breakfast by the sea for his friends. He, he uh, fed them and he ate with them. In fact, when he appeared to the many, he, they, he said, well, give me something to eat. And he, he ate a piece of fish. So he had a body. This isn't an ethereal spirit being or something, but, but it means holy perfected, filled with God's presence. So imperishable, life without death. Glorious, life without sin. Powerful, life without weakness. Spiritual, life without limits. To sum it up, we could say, verses 47 to 49, we'll be like Jesus. That's the point of what he's saying in 47 to 49. He's contrasting Adam and the Lord Jesus. Adam, the the man of dust, Jesus came from heaven. He left the throne of his glory where he had eternally existed as God the Son at the Father's right hand. And he came to earth as the infinite God-man so that he could die in our place, pay the penalty for our sin, rise from the dead, Verse 48, as as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And is in the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. He's contrasting again 
the earthly body and what is to come, Adam and Jesus. Verse 49, just as we have borne the image of this man of dust, so also bear the image of the man of heaven. When we're raised with Christ, we will bear the image of Christ. We'll be like him in his resurrection body. And then he kind of shifts and says it another way. After this contrast between Adam and Christ, then he shifts and he he says it another way. He says, um, there's a change coming. You see, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, verse 50. The perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 51, the verse that's in every church nursery in America. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. (laughs) But of course, it's the truth. There's a big change coming. We'll all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, verse 52, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed. The perishable body must put on the imperishable. No death. Mortal body must put on immortality. No death. Eternity. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory, echoing Isaiah 25 verse 8. We'll all be changed. Take a moment and look at what Peter said about this. If you'll turn to Peter's letters. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Near the end of your Bible there, shortly before Revelation, you'll find First and 2 Peter. In 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, Peter says it this way. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Underline that. Highlight that phrase. Partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. You're going to escape the perishable. Escape the weak. Escape the dishonorable. And put on something extraordinary. You'll partake in the divine nature of God. A few pages earlier, 1 Peter, 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3. This was already read by Pastor Thomas earlier in the service. 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. So there's the new birth. For every believer in Christ, a new birth. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What makes that new birth possible? That Christ is alive. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Verse 4, to an inheritance that is, this is going to sound familiar now, imperishable undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And so, as I began this message, we lately have been grieved by various trials. And it's been a heavy time. 
But above those trials and above that heaviness is the light of the gospel. It's the reality of the resurrection of Christ. It's the promises of God that with Christ we too will be raised. And that God has a great salvation, a great eternity, a great future for all those who are in Christ. Putting on the imperishable. Putting on immortality. The final victory won by Christ will be ours to enjoy. That's why he can echo Isaiah 25. God is going to swallow up death and say, that's happened in Christ. That's happened. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The final victory is ours in Christ. It is ours to enjoy. Thanks be to God. Verse 56, the sting of death is sin. Yes. The rebellion of man against Jesus, against God, the Creator, has brought all kinds of heartache into the world, including death. The power of sin is the law. That is, God made it clear to us that we're incapable of pleasing God by left to ourselves because the law makes it clear that we have broken the law of God. But thanks be to God, verse 57, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The victory has been won by Christ who is raised from the dead. The victory belongs to us because we are in Christ and with him we too will be raised from the dead. So knowing that hope, Knowing that confidence, knowing that assurance of Christ's resurrection from the dead, and that we are, therefore, steadfast, immovable, and can abound in the good work of the gospel. How do we remain steadfast in such a difficult, challenging time in our world. How do we remain immovable? That is not subject to fear and trembling. Though yes, we struggle with fear. But we preach the gospel to ourselves. We remember the reality of the resurrection and thereby we can abound in the good work of the gospel. And we can say too, with verse 58, our labors are worth it all. Our labors for the gospel are worth it all. They're not in vain at all. But the question I want to pose to you, brothers and sisters, is this. This change, we'll all be changed. Are you ready for that change? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ for forgiveness and for new life? And so you can say, as a child of God, I'm ready for the change. Bring it on, God. (laughs) Bring it on. I'm ready for the change. For that resurrection life that is prepared already for you. Let's pray. Oh God, my hope is that everyone hearing my voice right now is ready for the change. Has embraced Christ for forgiveness and salvation. Has trusted Christ to be their Lord and Savior and is therefore in Christ, a child of God, and ready for the change. You've made incredible promises to us, including these very promises this morning, Lord. That great promise that like Christ will have a resurrection body. Awesome. I pray that all here are ready because they've trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray in his name.
We're so glad you joined us today. We're going to stand one more time and sing one final song as we close, as we express our hope in Christ, in life, and in death. that is our confession. Christ, our hope in life, in death, in eternal life and forever. Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, our Lord and Master. Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we will reign with Him. <laughs>